Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for virtual Bulldogs Behind the Scenes, featuring a look at the Marshall W. Allworth Planetarium at UMD. Before we begin, we are going to take a moment here to pause so that everyone has a chance to log on. While we wait, um, you feel free to type your name, grad year if you're an alum of UMD, and where you are tuning in from in the chat box, and we will begin in just a moment. Well, my name is Molly Clevin, and I'm from the University of Minnesota Duluth Alumni Relations team. Today, we are going to take a behind the scenes look and tour of the planetarium that is housed on UMD's campus. Before we begin, I'd like to highlight some of our past programs. We've explored places like the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, Amsoil Arena, Superior Hiking Trail, the proposed UMD Sales Center, the Chocolate Lab, Romano Gym, and many more places. You can access all of these events on demand at our website, d.umn.edu slash alumni. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our alumni relations website. You will receive an email with a link once that is ready. Finally, we will have time at the end of the presentation to answer live questions. To submit a question, use the question and answer button on the bottom of your screen. Now to introduce our guest. Today, we will hear from Jessica Rogers. Jessica serves as a director of the Marshall W. Allworth Planetarium and as an instructor of astronomy at UMD. We are delighted to have her here today, and I will now turn it over to Jessica. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, hello, everyone. I'm very excited to kind of take you behind the scenes at the planetarium, um, show you some of the cool stuff that we do here. Um, and yeah. Let's get into it. So I'll start um, with just a brief introduction to my team here at the Planetarium. Um, so as we said, I am the Planetarium Director. I've been here since August of 2018. Um, I am one of two faculty that are on staff at the Planetarium, the other being Jim Rock, who is our Director of Indigenous Programming, um, who is also retiring at the end of the semester. So we're, we're very sad to see him go. Um, but the bulk of my staff actually consists of students. Um, I currently have six students on staff and um, they do everything, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. But yeah, that's all of us who run the planetarium here. So we'll start off with a little bit of background and history into the planetarium. So it was built between 1965 and 1967, thanks to a generous donation from Marsha William Allworth, who of course the planetarium is named after. Um, when it was first built, it was a structure all on its own. Um, since then, Marshall W. Allworth Hall has been built up around it. Um, so we are now um, part of Marshall W. Allworth Hall and connected to the rest of campus. And of course, since it was originally built back in 1967, we have had many renovations, um, changing up the projection systems that we use, installing new seats, um, you know, standard things that you update over the years and just make the space, you know, more comfortable and better as technology and things improve. So um, what we're gonna do now is take a little tour um, through our space. We don't have a huge space, but we do still have some really cool things. So this begins walking into the planetarium. Um, over to the right, we have our kids' corner and our gift shop. Um, just a fun little area for, you know, the kids' corner for kids to color and, and play before shows. Um, we have some displays out very cool displays on Mars and the Voyager mission and the moon missions. These are all in the process of being updated as well. Um, we also like to have some fun little hands-on things out for people to uh, enjoy and experience before and after shows. Our giant foam asteroid there that <laughs> um, finds various places to live throughout the year. 
Um, and then finally, we head into what we lovingly refer to as the Mars Room uh, because of this gorgeous mural of curiosity on Mars um, where people can take pictures. Um, and yeah, then we head into the planetarium itself. So the planetarium currently seats uh, 65 people um, in these very comfy chairs, as you can see here. Um, our controls happen there in the back of the room. Oops, I meant to pause it there, hold on. There we go. Um, our controls are at the back of the room. Um, that's where presenters will stand and present all of the shows. Um, we also have these really cool murals painted around the walls that get lit up with black lights um, that are always a huge hit. Um, and then here in the center of the room, is our two different projection systems. Uh, so first up, we see the Starball. This is actually original to the planetarium. This is the original system it opened with back in 1967. Um, and that Starball gives a gorgeous view of the night sky. Um, it still works beautifully, which is why we still have it up and it's still operational. And we use it to give tours of say like constellations and stars that you see up at night. Um, it's a really good kind of accurate depiction of how dark the sky can get and how bright the stars are. Um, which is why we still use it and love it. Um, but with the Starball, we are limited to just what we can see from here on Earth. So um, back in 2015, I had to check my notes there for a second, um, a second projection system was added to the planetarium, and this one is a digital projection system. Um, and that's the long bar with the gray box that you see um, to the right of the Starball. Um, that is our digital projector with a fisheye lens that projects onto the dome. And the beauty with the digital system is, you know, with that, we're not tied to just being on the Earth anymore. We can really go and explore the universe and see what there is to offer. Um, so with that, I am actually going to take us on a little bit of an adventure here. So um, this is currently showing the sky right now. Um, it looks a little funny because you are seeing the full circle that gets projected onto the domed roof of the planetarium. Um, so to kind of help orient you, the edges of the circle are what would be kind of at your horizon down at the bottom of the dome. And the very center of the circle is what would be directly overhead. So what you see kind of halfway between the center and the bottom of the circle is what would be kind of front and center in the planetarium, what you would be looking at. So with our digital system here, um, it's really cool. We can put in any date time and location and it'll show us what the sky looks like of course the benefit to the computer system is um, i can control the weather and make it as sunny as i want it to be and as clear as i want it to be and then of course we can head into the nighttime show off constellations um, talk about other things that you can see up in the nighttime sky but as I mentioned, the true beauty of the digital system is being able to actually leave the Earth. And so as I'm kind of flying us out here, um, right now we're looking down at our solar system. You're seeing a bunch of lines turned on which are the orbits of objects in our solar system. Um, those are obviously not actually there in space, but we like to have them turned on because it helps keep track of where things are. But everything in here is based off of real data. This is where the planets actually are at this date and time, where their moons actually are. And uh, I'm gonna fly us over to Mars.
And as we make our approach here, you will see that Mars is extremely detailed. And that's because this is all from real imaging, real detailed high resolution imaging that has been done of Mars. And we have such good imaging that I can fly us in to hover us just over the ground. And you can actually see the topography. You can see the indents from where the craters are, um, the peaks of the different mountains across the surface. And so we can essentially simulate, you know, what it would actually be like to fly over the surface of this planet. And of course, the, uh, these details are not limited to just the planets, um, although they are some of the things we have the most detailed imaging of. Looks like we are going to shortcut through Mars. Don't worry, um, completely safe. Um, but we, we can show accurate images and, and data on, you know, the moons as well. So this is one of Mars's moons, Phobos. And again, you can see that detail on the object. So anything that we have data for and imaging for, um, whether it's planets or moons or asteroids or comets, all of that we can show off here in the system. But of course, there is more to the universe than just our solar system. And so we can actually leave our solar system and travel out among the stars. And again, this is all real data. This is where stars actually are, their brightness, their color. This is what it would look like if you were to leave the solar system and fly through the stars. Obviously very much sped up to what traveling through space would actually be like, but it's all based off of real data and real, um, yeah, real data to model what we're seeing here. Um, and just like before, if we have the data and information, we can show it. So one of the cool things I like to point out to people, of all of these stars we have in our galaxy, you know, our sun isn't the only one to have planets. Um, every star that is now highlighted in green is a star that we found another planet around. That big green patch you're seeing um, is where the Kepler Space Telescope spent about four years just staring and watching four planets. That's why we found so many there. Um, but we do estimate that the rest of the sky would look just as jam-packed with planets if we were to spend the same amount of time looking everywhere else. And of course I can do one better. Instead of just showing you where all the planetary systems are, we can uh, actually go visit one of them. So this is the TRAPPIST-1 system. It has many different planets, and one of them, TRAPPIST-1e, is expected to be Earth-like. So when we have the information on what the planet might look like, we can display that. Now, this is obviously not real images at this point. Um, these are artist interpretations based off of the information we have about the planet. But again, if we have the information, we can show it. All right. Let's go see a few other cool things because we can. I can highlight 
other things out in the universe. Um, like right now, I am highlighting where uh, a certain type of star cluster called an open cluster is found in our galaxy. And from there, we can even go visit one. So open clusters are groups of stars that um, have fewer numbers of stars. We're talking tens to hundreds of stars in them. And the stars in open clusters are pretty spread apart. They're not really close together. Um, and so this is one of the most famous open clusters. This is the Pleiades star cluster. You may know it as the Seven Sisters. Um, and so this is a pretty quintessential open cluster that we can see. And again, real accurate 3D model here. All of the blue fuzzy stuff you're seeing in between the stars is actually um, gases left over. Uh, this is a relatively young group of stars. And so there's still a bunch of gas left over from when the stars formed that just kind of hasn't been pushed out and dispersed yet. Other things that we find in our galaxy are giant clouds of gas and dust. Um, a cloud of gas and dust in space is called a nebula, or the plural is nebulae. And there are many different types. Uh, the one we are flying to right now is the Orion Nebula. Um, so it is found in the constellation of Orion. It's actually in his sword hanging off of his belt. But this is a star forming region. Um, so this is actually a giant gas cloud where hundreds of solar systems are being born. These star forming regions tend to be the largest structures that we find in our galaxy. One more quick stop before we head on, um, just because I think it's really pretty and I like to show it off. This is the Ring Nebula. Um, so this is an example of a planetary nebula. Uh, and this is the result of the death of a small star like our sun. So this is what's going to happen to our sun in about 5 billion years. Going even more extreme, we can head in to the very center of our galaxy. And the center of our galaxy is home to uh, an object known as Sagittarius A star, which is a super massive black hole. And I love how I kind of move us around. You can actually see how the intense gravity of the black hole distorts the light around it. Because that's one of the ways that we find black holes is looking for their effects on their surroundings, like how light gets distorted around them. And you can see that so well in this. All right, very quickly heading back out because there are some other things I wanna tell you about the planetarium and I could spend an hour just doing this here. Um, we are not limited to just 
within our galaxy. We can head out and see our galaxy as well as all of the nearby galaxies. And just like I said with the stars, this is all based on real data. This is where galaxies actually are, what they look like. This is the universe we live in. Now these galaxies are only the brightest and closest galaxies to us. Um, there is even more out there, but we have to display it as just a point of light, a colored dot, um, since we don't have nice pictures. But we uh, can keep going and show more and more and more until we get to the very edge of our observable universe and the cosmic microwave background, which is the earliest bit of light that we are able to see in our universe. So that's just a little bit of what we can do with the digital system. Um, it's very powerful, very cool, and as I've said a few times, if we have the data and the images, we can display it. Um, and there are constantly, because astronomy is always discovering new things, all of this is constantly being updated so that we can show off all of the new stuff that has been found. Um, and for anyone curious, um, I just did all of that flying around with an Xbox controller because that's what we use and it's super fun. Um, so now that we are back to home, um, I will switch back over to tell you just a few more things about the planetarium itself. Hopefully I've piqued your interest into what we do. Um, so we have been back open for a little over a year now. Um, we do public shows um, every week. Uh, Wednesdays are virtual on our Facebook Live, uh, but Friday and Saturdays are in person. We have shows Friday evening and Saturdays at 2 and 7. And the different shows we do um, on Fridays are very much like I just showed you, doing tours of the solar system and the universe and just using this to kind of show off what's out there and what's in our universe. Um, our Saturday shows are pre-recorded movies. Um, full dome movies that show across the entire dome ceiling um, on a variety of topics. They change up every month. Um, and then each of those is also accompanied by a star show using the star ball to take a look at what the sky would look like that evening. In addition to our public shows, um, we also host a myriad of different private events from birthday parties. Um, we've had weddings in here before. We, of course, do field trips for uh, nonprofit groups and K through 12 groups as well. Um, we are on summer camps and have summer camps come visit us. Throughout the year, we also put on um, a number of different special events that are free and open to the public. Um, our two most popular are our big Halloween events and our astronomy day event, which we run in the spring. Um, and yeah, we also do, you know, lots of programs for students here on campus, um, giving free planetarium shows uh, monthly for UMD students. And of course, we also get our astronomy students in here as part of class as well. Um, as I said, I could not do what I do without my students. They help with every aspect of running this place, from actually running the shows and the special events to helping plan everything, creating new content, creating new shows. Um, one of my students is our social media manager, um, and she does a fantastic job with that. Um, so yeah, students are absolutely vital to the success of the planetarium. Um, and to end with, I wanted to show off a couple of these events that I talked about. This was uh, our Halloween event that we did before COVID. Um, and so you can see here, we have a fun activity set up in the atrium area. 
um, where guests can come and enjoy fun things. We run planetarium shows. We do telescope viewing out in the parking lots. Astronomy Day is very similar. This was Astronomy Day last year, where again, we have activities, planetarium shows, and telescope viewing if the weather permits it. Um, and everything we do here, we can take on the road. We have a portable planetarium, which is basically a giant inflatable dome. Um, this is our previous incarnation of this. Um, we currently have a new system. Uh, I don't have pictures of it because we haven't put it up enough for me to get a good picture, but it, it looks just like this, except it's blue instead of red. Um, this allows us to take our programming to places that can't come to us. Um, and for places that you know want us to visit, but maybe don't have the space to set up the full inflatable dome, um, which is pretty big. You can see inside here with a bunch of kids sitting around. Again, we can do all of the same programming that we do on site. Um, but we also have this panoramic option, which is still gives you know a bit of that immersive since you have a big curved screen, but it's not quite as big as our portable dome system. So it allows us to, again, travel to places that maybe can't come here, but also maybe don't quite have the space required for the big portable dome. Um, so to wrap things up, um, do a little plug. Uh, we actually do have our annual Astronomy Day event happening this weekend um, on Saturday, April 1st from 6 to 9 p.m. So if you're in the Duluth area and you want to come out, um, it's going to be a fantastic time. Uh, and if you want to just follow more of what we do, um, we are very active on Facebook and Instagram. Um, again, Facebook is where we run our Wednesday virtual shows. And then I've also got our website up here, which um, we also keep up to date with our public show schedule and any special events as well. Um, and I know I'm getting close to the time, but I also wanted to end very quickly with one other really cool project that the planetarium is involved with, and that is the Chickwalk All Sky Camera. Um, so we have partnered with the Chickwalk Museum and Nature Center, which is located at the end of the Gunflint Trail, to place a camera on the roof of the museum. Um, it's an all-sky camera, so it takes a 360 view, or 180 view, I guess. Um, it takes a full view of the sky above it, um, taking images every night, starting about 30 minutes before sunset and lasting to about 30 minutes after sunrise. Um, and it takes pictures about once an hour and then compiles all of those pictures into a time-lapse video of that night. Um, so we have a website for the camera that shows the up-to-date view, the most recent image that was taken, as well as the most recent time-lapse video. It also has links to all of the archives of past images and past videos. Um, we also maintain a Facebook page for the camera, which posts those uh, nightly time-lapse videos every day. And to just show it off a little bit, you can absolutely bet you we got a video of that incredible Aurora display that we had last week. So I wanted to just end off showcasing um, the Aurora from the night of the 23rd because it was incredible. And this camera got an insane show. I just, I'm still in awe of this. And I can now probably say I have seen the Aurora myself. We went out that night um, and I got to see it for the very first time. Um, so I'm very excited. It was such a cool night. All right. 
And with that, I will very quickly flip back to our kind of contact information and social media pages um, and wrap it up there. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed this and now are interested in coming to visit us because we do some really cool things here. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for sharing um, with us a little bit about this important and very impressive resource. Um, we are now going to transition to our live question and answer. Um, so both Jessica and I are going to flip our video cameras on here and we will get started. Do you want me to stop the screen share? I'm sure that would be great. So uh, we had a couple questions coming in. Um, again, if you want to submit one, um, the Q&A button is where um, you can add those questions. But the first one is wondering how sophisticated is the planetarium compared with others? That is a good question. Um, as far as the technology, um, it's on par. I mean, the system that we use, that digital system, um, is used in planetariums all around the world. Um, because we are a smaller dome, we do have one single projector, whereas larger domes have to have multiple projectors to cover the entire uh, ceiling. Um, but yeah, as far as technology, I mean, I'd say we're on par. Um, we're just you know, a smaller space, which I personally like because it means I get to talk with and interact with our guests as we do live shows. Um, I can answer questions as they come up. We can quickly, you know, someone, hey, can we go see this? Yeah, sure, let's do it. Um, so it lets us be a lot more kind of personal and interactive with our guests, which I like. And then wondering, this was a question that was submitted through the registration, uh, but someone was wondering, do you still have the old telescope from Darling Observatory? Yes. Um, so in that picture that I showed of Halloween, you could see the telescope there in the atrium. Um, and I can pull that back up real quick. Um, yeah, so right here in the atrium, uh, right when you walk into the Marshall W. Allworth Hall um, is where the, the original telescope is from the Dartland Observatory. It's dressed up for Halloween here. Um, as you can see, there's actually a giant spider on the other side of it, um, but we do have it there. Um, we've got a nice little display kind of talking about the original observatory um, and the telescope itself is no longer functional because it doesn't have its primary lens in it anymore. Um, but I do have that lens and I'm working on building a nice display case for it so that we can show that off as well. Um, this person is wondering, how does a planetarium keep up with current celestial events? That is one of the things that I have to say I love the most about astronomy because there is constantly new things and new events. Um, it means I never get bored with my job. Um, so we do good about just, um, as I said, when new discoveries come out, we're able to update our system um, and start incorporating those pretty quickly into shows that we already have established. Um, as far as like astronomical celestial events, like meteor showers, eclipses, um, we usually know about those pretty far in advance and are able to create programs around them. Um, speaking of, we've got the solar eclipse coming up on October 14th which we will be doing something for. Um, and then the big solar eclipse happening in April of next year, which we will also be doing something for. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. And actually this next question ties in really nice. Um, they're wondering, is any work going into helping Duluth become a, des a designated international dark sky city? Yes, um, I am part of uh, Starry Skies North, which is our local chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, and so there is a lot of work that is being done on that. Uh, we actually have a Dark Sky Week ordinance happening in April. I'm forgetting the exact week um, to celebrate. Um, and there's, there's a lot of work going into helping with you know, changing out the light designs and stuff to, to make it a bit better. Um, 
And I will also add that is why we chose Chick Walk to put the All Sky Camera at because it's right on the edge of the Boundary Waters, um, which is the largest international dark sky sanctuary in the world. Um, and it's the one of two places that you can get truly dark skies east of the Mississippi, um, with the other being in very northern Maine. So we are incredibly lucky here. Um, and we know that and are working to you know, educate and preserve the skies that we have. Well, and I think it goes without saying anyone that's traveled up to the Boundary Waters has certainly seen some amazing um, stargazing. So um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a question that just came in wondering about the information that you collect and how you share that information uh, maybe with others um, in terms of the data. So who do we partner with to share the information that UMD collects? What information? Uh, if there's Maybe if there's any sort of uh, data um, and any research that you're, you're using the planetarium for, do you share that with others? Okay. Um, um, yeah, so the only thing we have right now is the All Sky Camera, um, which everything is open to the public. Um, there are public archives for all of the past images and all of the past videos. Um, other than that, we don't currently do any research or anything here. Um, and so I don't know what other kinds of data there could be. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I really answered the question, but. <laughs> um, no, I think you answered it very well. So um, just a question about the outreach. Um, I know that you had uh, displayed a few different uh, mobile uh, planetariums. Who and what uh, do you share those with? What types of groups are you having outreach initiatives with? Um, it, it's actually pretty varied. Um, we take it to, for example, schools up on the Iron Range, that it's more cost beneficial for us to go to them than for them to come to us. Um, so we're able to set up usually like a gym and then the entire school will just come through throughout the day. Um, we also have community partners. We do a lot of science nights um, that we go out with. And then our big initiative um, that we actually take it out for is our dark sky caravan that we run in the summer, um, where we pack up the portable system and telescopes and activities, and we actually hit the road for a week, traveling to different sites along the North Shore to share our love of the night sky and, you know, as I mentioned before, educate on the dark skies and why we want to preserve them. Um, we've been doing that since the summer of 2018. Um, the past few years, we haven't taken the portable because of COVID, um, but I'm hoping to get it back out this summer. Um, and hopefully this summer will be the relaunch of our portable planetarium because it has been um, in storage for a couple of years, but we're, we're hoping to get it back out very soon. And then you did mention um, how big of a role students play within the planetarium. Um, can you talk a little bit about who those students are? Um, are they all science majors or are they um, from across disciplines on campus? Absolutely across disciplines. Um, I actually right now do not have a single physics or astronomy student um, working here. <laughs> um, I have everyone from biology, chemistry. I have a music education student. Um, who is phenomenal and doing, um, they're actually working on a show right now about um, the musical connection to astronomy because early astronomy and early math was done through music and musical notes and things. It was, math and music are very interconnected. Um, and so they're working on a show all about that, which I'm very excited for. Um, uh, our student who, handles our social media is actually a graphic design student so she also you know does all of our posters and and anything we need um so yeah at full range of backgrounds which i love because i get such varied knowledge and experiences and it's definitely not a requirement that they come in with all sorts of previous astronomy knowledge the only requirement is that they are excited and interested in learning the knowledge that they need. 
Well, one of my favorite memories when I was a student at UMD um, was we would go to the planetarium and they had these Pink Floyd shows and they would sync the music to the show and um, it was one of the coolest experience ever. <laughs> so I know there's a lot that uh, that can be done um, creatively. So um, thanks for sharing about those students. Um, there's a question uh, that came in um, related to what we're talking about in terms of uh, they're wondering, they read recently about a giant hole on the sun. Do you know anything about this? And do you have an explanation? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the coronal hole that led to the impressive aurora display we had last week. Um, so the corona is the sun's outer atmosphere. And every so often, um, parts of it will just kind of explode out. And a bunch of stuff will get flung off the sun. Um, and if that stuff heads to the Earth, and when it hits the atmosphere, when it gets here, that's what creates auroras. Um, and so we had a pretty big one happen um, earlier last week, which is why we had that impressive aurora display at the end of last week. Makes sense. Uh, someone was wondering, um, they've always wanted to take a, an Astronomy 101 course. Um, wondering if you have any tips for getting that course experience um, or if you have any recommendations for someone just getting into astronomy. Absolutely. Um, so if you're in the Duluth area, Bob King, also known as Astro Bob, um, does a course with the, um, the Community Ed series. Um, which he actually does here in the planetarium, um, all about kind of intro to astronomy stuff. He's fabulous, fantastic. So if you're in the Duluth area, would recommend looking into that. He does it, I'm pretty sure, if twice a year, three times a year. It's, it varies, um, but he does it all the time, so that's great. Um, if you're not in the Duluth area, um, there are honestly some really good resources on YouTube. Um, Crash Course Astronomy on YouTube is a fantastic series, um, which is um, was narrated and written by uh, Phil Plate, who actually worked with the Hubble Space Telescope. He's also a kind of astronomy news writer, um, and he's very good at what he does. Um, so that's another good resource. Perfect. Thank you. This one is a little bit more of a personal question. Um, but for you, Jessica, how did you, where did your fascination come with the stars and astronomy and how did you choose a career um, in this? So I always feel like I never have a satisfactory answer for this. I've just always loved the night sky. Um, so I, for most of my life, have always said I wanted to work for NASA. I wanted to work in astronomy and, and do something with space. Um, I don't remember a time in my childhood where that wasn't my goal. Um, as I went through school and, you know, started having to find jobs after grad school, um, one of the jobs I found was in a museum working as an observatory educator at the museum. And that's when I kind of fell in love with the informal education side of, of education and, and science. Um, and that's when I realized this is this is what I want to be doing. Um, and that led me to the job here. Um, so, yeah. Great. Um, and then finally, this will be our last question. If you could choose either one star, one planet, one galaxy, what is the one thing you are is like your favorite is a soft spot for you within this our solar system? This is such a hard question. <laughs> I just made it up, so I'm curious. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is such a hard question. Um, you know what? I think I think I'm gonna have to go with one of Jupiter's moons named Europa because it has a huge ocean that we think might have life in it. And we're actually sending like submarines there. I mean, we're like a couple decades out from this happening, but we're sending submarines to explore the ocean, which might have alien fish. Um, so that's kind of my current fascination, I guess, is, is the best answer I can give you. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, it was kind of a loaded question, but 
Very interesting. Um, and with that, um, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise with all of us. Um, I know that as we're using those interactive modules uh, in the digital system, it makes you definitely feel very small, um, a little bit insignificant, uh, but it was a very impressive show. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and if there were other questions that you all had today that maybe weren't answered, um, we will send a follow-up email to all of you um, with some information for you to contact the planetarium um, and Jessica and her staff, um, or feel free to reach out directly to us and we will um, connect, connect you to them as well. Additionally, if you're not an alum of UMD, our office hosts about one to two of these sessions every month. Um, and if you would like to be added to our mailing list, um, feel free to send us an email um, and we will be sure to add you. Um, again, a big thank you, Jessica, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thanks and have a great day.